Dr. So Daniel Glazer, and I'm a neuroscientist by training, which makes me completely unqualified to host this evening's event. Uh, as director of science engagement here at the Institution, and it's a delight to see you all here. If you've been to the RI before, put your hands up now. Ooh, if you've not been to the RI before, put your hands up now. If you're not sure if you've been to the RI before. <laughs> okay, good. So you're all very welcome. This is a different talk than we often have. We have the desk, as you probably know, that Michael Faraday used in this theatre inside there. We're not using that this evening. Uh, the experiments uh, and the fireworks are all mental uh, and discursive and deliberative this evening. But that means uh, nothing to the level of excitement. We're still delighted to have you all here. Um, our speaker this evening is fond of a, 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 a maxim which he believes, and I'll take his word for it, uh, from Jean-Paul Sartre. What Sartre said was that if you find uh, that people are offended by what you say equally from both sides of an argument, then you must be doing something right if you're offending people and people from the other side. And so, especially those of you that have come for the RI not for Slavo, who, doesn't, who don't know him, may find yourselves exercised or offended by what you hear. And I just want to reassure you that there will be also people here who will be offended by the reverse. Okay? So, I'll remind you of our code of conduct, which is available online. We're having a, a, a discussion which is open to all views, and the RI is a safe space for everybody's positions. We're not going to be discussing individuals or their beliefs but uh, uh, the topic of the talk uh, will be set out for you. So I'm very grateful to you for joining with me in welcoming our speaker this evening, Slavoj Žižek. Yeah, but at one point, I don't know where does he stand here, 
he is more in a uh, surprise, surprise. I'm not now losing time. This will bring me to the topic of what I will try to uh, com uh, communicate here. Namely, uh, his idea is, if I understood it correctly, that temporality is just an effect of our subjective perspective limitation. That if you were to see all, which is theoretically impossible, time would literally become just another dimension of space. Time, uh, the time is limitation. I, with no scientific proofs, it's, I admit it openly as kind of a this instinctual, I hate these words because I don't believe in instincts, uh, it, with my instinctual guts, I think that if you adopt this so-called block theory that past, present, future are all in some sense already here, we just cannot see them all, that you lose something extremely important, the maybe the what I call not just simple in some stupid humanist sense openness of the universe, but in a much more precise way, the my that's why I'm fascinated by quantum physics, the idea and who cares about all that politics now right let's go a little bit into more serious things. What absolutely fascinates me is the idea that the world reality is in itself, I hope it will not sound too complicated, ontologically unfinished. What do I mean by this? Some of you may know my line of thought, but I like it so much that I will have to repeat it now. And I usually, I found this in some introduction to philosophy, I forgot the name. Uh, uh, think about uh, 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 playing video games. Let's say you play some stupid game, cowboy shooting, a bandit, whatever, and in the background there are trees, there are houses, but you are not, but the programmer did not program the inside of the houses or the details of the forest, because it's not part of the game that you go there while you time. And now, quite some uh, quite some uh, uh, quantum physicists. I like this. This is where okay, it's just a joke, a metaphor, but you learn a lot. Uh, applied this ironically, they are materialists to God Himself. The idea is that God created the universe for us, but He thought people are stupid. It's enough if I do the job to the atom and elementary parts of the atom. Why go into all that quantum? People are too stupid. And then, and then they even have, you know, that Austrian guy who got, I admire him very much, uh, Zeilinger, I think. I love the fact you think I know. <laughs> 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 I, yeah, yes, or no, I don't know, some guy. Yeah. You have to know. <laughs> Otherwise, you will join in Gula. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, let's uh, remain serious. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, he said that they call this, they even have a jargon for this, the hypothesis of a lazy god, you know. Like he said, ah, why should I bother with those quantum stuff? No. But then the challenge is what if the universe is nonetheless, in some sense, objectively existing without God, but nonetheless unfinished? that literally reality is not full. Then this is how then you, of course, can interpret the so-called collapse of the wave function and so on and so on. But uh, why am I mentioning this here? Because uh, we were talking uh, before on the influence of T.S. Eliot on Shakespeare. You told me this. And conservative as he was, a couple of points that were made by T.S. Eliot, I like them very much. For example, in his, I think, tradition in the individual talent, where he says that every new work of art 
not only introduces a break, but changes the entire past. And let's be very precise here. We are not here at the level of magic. What happened, happened. But the symbolic status, the meaning of the past, changes all the time. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, that's why, for example, I am totally opposed to a historicist, primitive historicist approach to great classics, which is to understand Shakespeare, you must read all books that you can about Elizabethan England and so on and so on. No, I'm almost tempted to say the opposite. To understand Elizabethan England, <laughs> read Shakespeare. You get it there on that. So what I want to say is that, did you have already at some point this magic, really magic, I mean, feeling that, like, hey, T.S. Eliot, let's say, influenced on Shakespeare, that uh, uh, some later interpretation, although it's clear it wasn't already in the original, allows you to see original in a totally new way, but in such a radically new way that it's not enough to say, yeah, the contemporary interpreter put it, put it, into and so on. It really, in some way, I don't want to get lost here uh, in this uh, quantum physics metaphorics, but in some way, as a wave, vibration, whatever, it was already, at least the possibility for it was already here. Uh, and I uh, I like so much, I'm a big fan, even further from your science, a big fan of the opera. I hope it's not, I will just mention two examples, mega popular. Jean-Pierre Ponel uh, uh, did some 20 years ago uh, a version of, in, uh, in uh, uh, Bayreuth of Wagner's Tristan und Isolde. You know, at the end, is all the arrives and they both die together. Ponelli did something so simple, but the feeling is, my God, that's it. The final appearance of Isolde is just the dream of the deluded Tristan. You have Isolde there in all the light, singing her Liebestod, love, death, and then you have the moment of darkness, and then light and Tristan alone just there. There is something so deeply true in it. Or another uh, very bad opera. But interesting end. I hope you know at least some of you Tosca, Puccini. You know, at the end, uh, 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 Cavardossi, the lamp of Tosca is shot. Uh, and, uh, but Tosca thinks he made, a, he made a deal with the bad guy that he will not really be shot. And then you have this tragic moment. He calls him Mario, Mario, Mario. She sees that he is really dead and throws herself from that castle. Okay, what if I found this uh, philosopher, my friend Alain, but you had this idea. What if, because the, the, the music allows for this without words, what if uh, 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 Tosca already runs to the edge to jump down when Cavaradossi starts to move and says, ha ha, don't jump too fast, I was just joking, I'm really alive, and then the two embrace, and the music that we get, the triumphant music, would work much better here <laughs> than here. Not to mention other wonderful example. you were a professor of this, like uh, Hamlet, the best Hamlet I know, go to Pirate Bay, you can uh, download it, is uh, by uh, Akira Kurosawa, set in contemporary Japan, where Hamlet is, makes out a joke, is played by Toshiro Mifune, who is a student returning from the United States and then the story. But it, a wonderful title, which is so deeply true. Only bad people sleep well. 
Of course, because the woman you want and then no conscience is haunted you, you see. It's so, uh, uh, you see, this is what fascinated me so much, how our present is open. We don't yet know what it will mean. I usually mention here a big legend, which is not quite true, but it's a beautiful one. In 1952 3 when there were negotiations about uh, how to end Korean War, Chu and Lai, the second guy in China, was in Geneva, I think negotiations were there, and the French journalist asked him, what do you think about French Revolution? And Chu and I said, in a totally correct way, it's too early to say. <laughs> in what sense he was right? Do you remember when communist regimes disintegrated? The big debate was, you have be between more conservative historians who claim the era that began with French Revolution is now over. And it was Quite lucky that it was exactly 200 years, no? And now we are in a post-ideological, pragmatic universe, blah, blah. So it's literally that our present decides how we will interpret the past. Now, enough of this. Uh, jokes, let's go on. I think we are today and I'm talking about not only the Israel-Gaza war, but also general situation, ecology, immigrants, and so on. I think we are now in a similar open situation. We can feel it. We don't, we know we are at a moment when things will change, but it's not clear in what direction they will go. We have the possibility of a catastrophic reading that uh, uh, neoconservatives, populists will take over, and here I don't fear so much the so-called Arab terrorists. If you ask me, I fear for the United States. Will it survive as a democracy? You know, the guy who was now elected, I prefer to forget uh, his name, Mike something, the new speaker of the Congress. He's a total Trump madman, worse than Trump himself. I mean, so uh, uh, will it be this direction? Will it go into another direction? What can happen with ecological crisis? What will happen with, uh, what will be the result of the war in the Middle East now. I think that here again the scientific metaphors help me. First I would like to introduce a distinction with this subtitle which is greater than the title uh, What lies ahead when there is no future? Uh, I would like to introduce here, I think I begin the book with this. Uh, we have, if we are lucky in Slovenia, uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have it, Germans don't have it, but the French have it, two terms for what is to come, future and avenir. Future is basically the prolongation of the same as goes on now. Like, if there will be in the United States next year, remember, presidential elections, and if Biden will win, then you can say Biden is the present and the future president. But you cannot say le président à venir. This means a different next one. And that's, I think, our problem today. Our future is written as a very catastrophic scenario. If you ask me, I don't see a way out. I'm more and more a pessimist. And I'm just hoping that, like a miracle, like Avenir, something will come. Now, a little bit more this very simple theoretical. Uh, sorry, I'm confused. I, 
I never sure when I see this, I will just scratch in your beard or want to ask a question. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah. Wait, the, the, the formalism is that we'll take questions in a batch. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So I will not let's, be let's wrong, but yeah, thank you. Right? So, yeah. Yeah. so my uh, idea is this one. You should maybe invite him. He's a genius. Did you hear about him? Jean-Pierre Dupuy, D-U-P-U-Y. He's a French theorist of catastrophes who also uh, works at, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, a little bit in Seattle, in Santa Cruz, and so on. And he developed a wonderful theory of how necessity arises out of contingency. The situation is confused, but then when, in a contingent way, certain version wins, it retroactively makes sense. You know, it, it's a different story. Now you will say it's just a story. Ah, ah, stories are for me never just stories. Stories determine how we act in our history. So uh, at Dupuy develops this into detail. He, it's a wonderful quote in one of his early books when there were certain pre-presidential elections by a politician who is now already dead, uh, uh, Balladur, and uh, 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 Dupuy quotes a line from Le Monde where it says, if, if Monsieur Balladur will win next weekend pre-election, then his victory will be necessary. You see the point, how something happens in a contingent way, but once it happens, we read it as necessary. Now, again, <coughs> you will say, but this is some mystery, and so, no, 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 think about love. How do you fall in love? You never fall in love, it's my old story, some of you know it, uh, sorry, you never say, I will be consciously vulgar now, I'm sorry, that I will not try not to be prostituted at that point. Like, let's say, here is a lady and there and there. I like her hair, I like her eyes, I like her legs, then I look again and make up. Oh, but I like three things about her and two and then I choose her. No, the paradox is that you have reasons to fall in love, but these reasons work as reasons once you already fell in love. Love has this magic capacity of retroactively positing, creating even its own uh, reasons. We say it was meant to be. What? Love. Yeah, before that, you said it was meant to be. Yeah, yeah, it was meant to be, but it's contingent. But once you are in, and now we have another philosophical paradox here. Schelling, not the one whom I also appreciate very much, maybe you know Thomas Schelling. But... <laughs> <laughs> just your full acceptance just got <laughs> no, no, seriously. Uh, he was a key uh, theorist of risk and chance, who was maybe a crucial person in avoiding nuclear war in the Cold War era, very intelligent. But I'm talking now about the old German idealist Schelling, who says uh, that, uh, who says basically the same thing that the things where you are really free, the most radical freedom, like love, to fall in love, it must be free. You perceive them as necessity. Again, that's why you never can say, I'm now falling in love. All of a sudden, you discover retroactively that you are in love. Now, enough of this introductory stuff. I am terribly afraid that we are now in such a situation. Imagine a mega catastrophe, ecological, military, and so on, and uh, who knows how we will reconstruct our past? I have, no, I have no idea. So here comes, now this may surprise you, my anti-Marxist moment. Marx was, for me, still too much caught in 
historicist teleology in the sense of moving towards a final goal. Marx knew things can go wrong, but nonetheless, basically, today's society is opening up a path for, for new uh, communist society, whatever, and so on and so on. I, as a materialist, I'm much more Hegelian here. People forget Hegel's modesty. Forget all the bullshit, Hegel, absolute knowing, I know everything. No, you remember what Hegel says in the introduction to his philosophy of right. He says it literally. The future, we cannot say anything reasonable about it. All that philosophy can do is like his famous metaphor, the all of Minerva, which takes off in the dusk. Philosophy can only grasp a certain epoch when this epoch begins to disintegrate. This doesn't mean that Hegel was an idiot about the future. For example, in 1825, in his lectures on the philosophy of history, apropos Russia and United States, he says, it's too early to say what they are, they will be the countries of the next century. It's not so bad to say. But what I, I want to praise here Hegel in the sense that we are in an open situation. All we know is that we are now in a social order, let's call it global capitalism, which is decaying, which is gradually decaying in different forms and so on. I will not go into it. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, what's the, okay, now I, uh, this is for me, the big problem. We have to accept that in my Lacanian jargon, there is no big other. There is no predestined symbolic structure which, if only we were to know it, it would tell us how to act now. No, through our acts, we create the very narrative which justifies our acts. The situation is open. What now I come to more hot, but in a horrible sense, stuff, what's the most dangerous thing in such a situation? It is uh, uh, what I'm really afraid today. It's not egotism. I'm so tired of this, all these things about, you know, we are consumerist egotists and so on and so on. No. What really worries me is evil which perceives itself as ethical greatness. First example here would have been, uh, uh, I just read a book about Ukraine, but around that Holodomor, 1930-32, where, how were the Bolsheviks uh, training people. They were telling them openly, you will see horrible things, small children starving, uh, uh, um, desperate mothers, blah, 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 and you will have to take food of them, maybe even kill them, and so on. And the idea was, if you feel any sympathy for them, you are a traitor. The true patriot is the one who can do even horrible things for his country. The most terrible example of this is uh, Heinrich Himmler, the boss of SS, who in his famous speech in Posen, today Posner, in October 43, uh, says again, he says, of course, if you see a starving Jewish kid and mother, this arouses sympathy. But he says, the moment you show respect for the minimum human dignity of the enemy, you are, uh, uh, you are a traitor. Uh, so uh, what, again, what I, uh, what I find so horrible here is precisely this fake ethics of Himmler. He was not simply a brutal guy. He, now I will say something, I hope I will not hurt any of you. You know that Himmler 
Hitler, yeah, that guy, Holocaust and so on. Hitler, you know what was his favorite book? He always had a special letter about coffee in, uh, a copy in his pocket. Bhagavad Gita. You know, this idea of when you act, don't fully identify with your act. Hitler openly says, my problem is, how can SS people kill the starving Jews, blah, blah, and retain their dignity at the same time? The answer was, uh, the answer was uh, Bhagavad Gita. And I think that this terrifying ethics, the ethics of a fake cause where on behalf of the cause, you have to, you have to uh, sacrifice your basic sense of, this, uh, of decency, dignity of others, and so on and so on, that it's today massively returning. Till now, it was more or less half hidden. hidden. Discreetly, you admitted it. For example, I was shocked. You probably don't remember who was Rafael Trujillo. He was the dictator, uh, the dictator of Dominican Republic, and in 37 he did a mega slaughter, so-called parsley slaughters, throwing out all the Haiti people. He sent soldiers to the border, and they asked, they showed persons a little bit of parsley, and asked them, what is this? Because Haiti were French, they pronounced it in a French way. And uh, 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 Dominican Republic were Spanish. It's again the wrong answer, they killed them. And you know what I find so horrible? When, uh, at the end of his life, he was asked, what is your greater, uh, greatest act, he says this, that I gathered moral courage to do this. This is how more and more, even these days, in, on both sides, in Gaza and so on, uh, uh, I think that this is returning. This terrible logic of uh, you take a pride in committing a crime. You are slaughtering people, but in deeper sense, even some theologists say, put it in this way, in a deeper sense, a true hero is ready to sacrifice his soul to the devil just to do his uh, duty, uh, his uh, duty towards uh, towards, the, towards his country, or I don't have time to develop it now, but just to give you an idea, uh, there is a wonderful old joke that I know you all heard. Uh, you know, uh, some uh, people come to uh, 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 explorers come to a lone tribe and ask, are there still cannibals in your tribe? And you know what's the answer they get? No, last week we ate the last one. <laughs> but this is how our politics is more and more doing. It's no longer some primordial founding crime. It is, and I think this began with Stalinist purges, that uh, all the time we are eating the last cannibal. With Stalinist, this meant Trotsky is the enemy, whoever was there, and so on and so on. And uh, 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 I think, now to provoke you very modestly a little bit more, that uh, the same happens up to a point in so-called cancel culture. I totally subscribe to the goals of cancel culture for diversity, uh, tolerance, and so on. But did you notice, okay, I will now refer to an analytic philosopher, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who has, in his tractatus already, but later he developed it even more, this difference between saying something and zeigen, showing it. Uh, do you maybe know another Norwegian uh, 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 theorist, uh, John Elster? You know him. I'm the representative of the audience. I don't know any of the references. <laughs> I'm sure there are others who do not know. Okay. And I'm no, here no, to say I mean, I mean Esther introduced a wonderful term, states which are essentially 
by product, like dignity. If you say I'm a dignified person and so on, it's ridiculous. No? You must show dignity by how you act. You cannot in first person define yourself as define yourself as dignified. And I think something of the same order happens often with a cancel culture. Forget about what they are saying, uh, diversity, uh, uh, inclusion, and so on. Just look at what they are showing by their acts, what they are doing. They are excluding all the time. They are canceling people who don't fit their definition of inclusion, and so on, and so on. And this is why my problem with cancel culture is uh, did you notice how it is, it is just self-destructive. There is a perverse pleasure in it of destroying Western legacy. Science, oh, it's main chauvinistic, uh, logocentric, and so on. Freedom and uh, human rights, oh, these are the rights of white men, and so on, and so on. I would return to my Hamlet example. No, they are open notions. Yes, at the beginning, obviously, there was a hidden spin. Human rights really meant the rights of white men with some property and so on. But you know what happened then? Immediately, Mary Wollstonecraft, women also. Then you had, for me, a mega event, Haiti Revolution. Why not us blacks also? And so on and so on. So, uh, 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 much more than just this negative critique of ideology, throwing all the Western tradition out, I'm tempted, I hope I will not offend you too much, trying to provoke you, my God, I'm tempted to say precisely today, when Europe is so universally hated and is losing everywhere, you know, Donald Trump hates Europe. If you know, I know because I enjoy reading them. These extreme right conspiracy theorists, for them, the true enemies European Union, not ISIS or Al Qaeda. They are just instruments of European capital. Uh, so, what I would have, and then, of course, third world European colonialism and so on and so on. But what if what we need today is precisely something which, in however mystified, for it is, in practice, Europe is betraying itself all the time, but are we aware that even the critics of neocolonialism and all that use concepts developed by European Enlightenment? So I'm absolutely, I'm not ready to renounce European Enlightenment. I think that even people who you think that they are more radical, they are, but not in the wrong way. Like, I always admired Frank Fanon, who stated this openly. Fanon, in his earlier book, White Faces, Masks, Black, I don't know the other way around, Frank Fanon, he says, I don't care for any original African wisdom, and so on, and so on. He, he knew what he's talking. And now, to my concluding, but more, most important part, I think that <coughs> precisely we should not renounce this European speed, uh, stance of enlightenment, of listening to all sides, of questioning everything in today's Gaza-Israel uh, war. Maybe some of you know, I gave a speech there at the opening of the Frankfurt Book Fair, and uh, I even went maybe too far. I said I absolutely condemn Hamas attacks, and I meant this sincerely, because I didn't know directly people who were slaughtered there, but I know people who knew them. And do you know that they were the most open uh, around, among the Jews? They were all the time, precisely in that kibbutz that was slaughtered, and that race party. So why did Hamas do it? 
I think the explanation is relatively simple. It was not so much the new to win the war, but to make a war to guarantee that there will not be peace, to eternalize the war, to sabotage any, any uh, uh, possibility. In this sense, I think, uh, I'm not identifying anybody, but uh, uh, some of the figures around Netanyahu, I'm not saying they are the same, but come pretty close to this Hamas stance. For example, do you know who is now <coughs> kind of a royal joke for maybe this royal? <laughs> do you know who is now Minister for uh, Public Security or whatever of Israel? Itamar, Itamar Ben Gvir, who was 20 years ago condemned as a terrorist and racist by whom? By Israel itself. He is now the guy who runs, uh, who runs uh, security there. So uh, the horror here is the following one. I know, I quote it all the time, what uh, the leader of Hamas said. We have only one thing to say to you, to Jews. Get out of our land. Get out of our sight. The land is ours, Al Quds, Jerusalem is ours, everything here is ours, there is no place or safety for you. Clear and disgusting. But I'm not putting them at the same level. But look what the present government of Netanyahu, when they took power, they announced their so called basic principle. Here is the first principle, the Jewish people have an exclusive and inalienable right to all parts of the land of Israel. The government will promote and develop the settlements of all parts of the land of Israel in the Galilee, Negev, Gola, Judea, Samaria, which means West Bank, and so on. Or as Netanyahu stated, Israel is not the state of all its citizens, but of the Jewish people and only it. Now, what I'm saying and, uh, is that what if, this is my a little bit of conspiracy theory, what if there is, I'm not saying direct causality, but in some sense link between the Hamas attack and what went on, remember, a couple of months ago in Israel, this big conflict between secular powers and what Netanyahu is doing now, basically, the Israelis were always proud, we are the only democracy there, where they are now more and more becoming, uh, uh, becoming a, a theocratic state. Israel, what I want to say is just this. I hope we all find this acceptable. Again, friends of my friends were slaughtered by Hamas, but I think that Hamas and the Israeli hardliners, they have formally the same goal, our land without the other. They say it more or less openly, the present government. And I'm not here celebrating as Palestinians. I think they made many mistakes. There is also anti-Semitism there and so on and so on. But uh, I, uh, I think that uh, to understand what goes on now in this conflict, don't focus just on Gaza. Yeah, horrible things are happening there but uh, focus on the West Bank. Silently there, this slow ethnic cleansing is going on. So then I will finish, if I may just, oh, oh, show the clip, please. If. You see, I made a joke before that the guy will fall asleep. He's so focused, he's wonderful. Ah, yeah, yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
from 1935. We must separate the Jews into two categories, the Zionists and the partisans of assimilation. The Zionists profess a strictly racial concept and through emigration to Palestine, they help to build their own Jewish state. Our good wishes and our official goodwill will go with them. Reinhard Heinrich, the father of Holocaust. He, and then the next guy, you know, you remember that guy, Breivik, that crazy Norwegian terrorist who shot him. Uh, he said the same. He said Israel should kill Palestinians, they should, that Al Aqsa, they should destroy, build temple, but not here. Here, he, he said, it's, uh, the Germans took care of Jews in Europe, but England and especially United States, they still have a problem and so on. And what terrifies me absolutely unconditionally is that somehow the Zionism, the way it is practiced by the state of Israel now, will implicitly, or not even so implicitly, co begin to collaborate with Zionist anti-Semites. Now you will ask me, where are they today? Let me name one, obviously, Donald Trump. He was very much pro-Israel, allowed him to annex uh, Golan Heights and so on and so on. At the same time, he was supported by all those groups, Proud Boys and so on, which are more or less openly anti-Semitic, you know, I, I, this is my vision, this horrible vision of even what we perceive as two opposites, Zionists and anti-Semites, in a perverse way they collaborate. Because what did Hamas effectively achieve with its attack? Stop the big protests in Israel against this new uh, civil law and so on and so on. So to conclude, I promise now, uh, 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 I will just read you uh, one paragraph from the end, I quote it really at some point, of one of my great uh, books, Ruth Plüger, a girl who survived Holocaust in Auschwitz, wrote mem memoirs, still alive, the Holocaust, Holocaust girlhood remembered. And Ruth Klüger describes a conversation with some advanced the, uh, P, uh, philosophy candidates in Germany. Quote, one reports how in Jerusalem he, one of these candidates, made the acquaintance of an old Hungarian Jew who was a survivor of Auschwitz, and yet this man cursed the Arabs and held them all in contempt. How can someone who comes from Auschwitz talk like that? The German asks. I get into the act and argue, perhaps more hotly than need be. What did he expect? Auschwitz was no instru instructional institution. You learned nothing there, and least of all humanity and tolerance. Absolutely nothing good came out of the concentration camps. This is what we should all remember. It's uh, mainly, this is another version of that idea, heroism, false heroism through committed crime. This idea that in extreme situations where you are a victim, it may, it may ennoble you, it may also make you, make, it may even uh, make you even worse. So again, To really conclude, <laughs> I think as soon as you put the notes down, you can close it. We're going to stop at the top of the hour. So yeah. Okay. So what should we do? You know. Now I will be really gently <laughs> and play what I know, a postmodern Derrida, and I will say you, you see, because you stick to the metaphysical linear notion of time. <laughs> <laughs> If you want to hear something funny, so when Carlo Rovelli came and spoke on Friday, he was speaking in a format which was originated in 1825, 
uh, where the bell rings at the beginning and then the bell rings at the end of the hour. We don't apply this to you. I'm just looking at the book. No, no, no. And I did the joke to him. I came in with the bell rang and I said, I'm sorry, Carlo, but in this talk, time is not relative. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you know how, how uh, uh, we did in Frankfurt when we had another much better debate. We had... <laughs> No, 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 no. That, that, uh, that, how do you call it, that dust, you know, for hard-boiled eggs and so on. Egg timer. Egg timer, yes. We need egg timer, I think. Or digital clocks. No, no, quite, no, sorry, quite seriously. But you see what's my message. Uh, uh, this is what I like about, many people don't like them, but they are my guys still. Robespierre and St. Just. St. Just made a wonderful point. He said a revolutionary is not somebody who knows the historical necessity. He said a revolutionary is like a captain on a boat in a storm without compass and has to improvise and so on. And that's what we can learn today. We need Hegel more than ever. You know what is Hegel doing? Not justifying things, but Hegel is, for me, the great thinker of distrust. Hegel always takes uh, an enthusiastic moment, like French Revolution, and with a suspicion. Oh, whoa, whoa, how will terror arise out of it? Hegel, I think, would have loved the second part of 19th century, because, you know, it was, at least for us in Europe, the era of relative prosperity, uh, in Germany, Bismarck introduced even health. Where is KGB? Nothing, no, 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 that's not true. <laughs> uh, uh, what I want to say is that uh, this is the task of thinking today, maybe even more than to make great plans for the future. This healthy skepticism, yes, we have a great plan, but focus on how can it go wrong. Like, Hegel would have loved Lenin, okay, he was a tough guy, but he was not nonetheless Stalin. At the beginning, there was some kind of enthusiasm. Oh, 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 after a couple of years, you get Stalin. You know, how things go wrong. Liberalism, oh, you get fascism. This is what we should focus on these days. Always think about how some well-thought-out plan can go wrong. Sorry if I was too long, but perfect. Thank you. If you don't know it, I will briefly repeat it very short. You know what's my joke, no? Compare fascist leader and Stalinist leader giving a speech. Fascist leader receives the applause at the end. Stalinist leader stands up and joins the applause. <laughs> no, no, that's a big difference, because in Stalinism, a uh, leader is just a servant of the people, like there is a cause outside, I'm just instrument. There are, I don't uh, celebrate in any way Stalinism. In some sense, it was even worse. But this difference, thank you so much. For example, do you know that, and I got this from Anne Applebaum, from her Gulag book, do you know that every year on Stalin's birthday, they, all the prisoners in the Gulag camp, in every, were, got together and had to sign a, a, a telegram wishing all the best to Stalin. Now, this is unthinkable in Nazism. Let's gather the Jews and make them. <laughs> you see, and, and, and this is not even, I'm not saying that Stalinism is better. The tragedy is that. Stalinism is still our European enlightenment gone wrong. Yeah. I, no, well, really, really. So it's really hard to distinguish between when you are about to finish and have finished. So, <laughs> so, so the, the pro tip, by the way, with the applause, the microphones are very sensitive, so we learn to clap but silent <laughs> when you're on the stage. Because otherwise the microphone is overwhelmed. Can I ask you a question? And it's a technical one. We're coming to questions from the floor, but there's a question I want to start with, which is of technical nature, yeah. but I also think it's really yeah. interesting. So when I read through the book, the These part. yeah. Others also, but this one. The, um, the, there was some stuff about Israel Palestine in there, and it's referred to to some extent. Yeah. And also, therefore, the blurb that we had for this evening 
did not particularly focus on Israel, Palestine, Hamas, and so yeah. on, because we wrote it before the attacks and the consequences. Um, it's really striking to me that if you look at the current situation, uh, which you've described, you know, in, in, in terrible detail, uh, it's ex it excited tremendous popular responses across the world. There have been demonstrations in London and other cities, almost, and I don't need to trivialize it. It's imaginable to me if there were 100,000 in London that globally there are as many people marching mm -hmm. as there are people in Gaza, you know, in, in a funny sense, right? 10 times 100,000 comes to a million, maybe it's 20 cities marching. I'm not doing a what about question, but I'm asking you, Joanie, what do you think is the fascination, which you've exhibited to some extent now because it's immediate, yeah, yeah. but more generally, there are very few things that get that number of people on the street. What is the fascination of the Israel-Palestine question in the public imagination? What is its relevance? What is its apparently central res res um, resonance, and repeatedly so, for these questions about uh, but did you follow that debate in Germany? They even called it the new historical struggle, when it was between, on the one hand, that Africa guy on Bembe, or how is he called? Again. <laughs> okay, he's a big historian of ideology, and on the other side, Habermas and some others, and I intervened into it with some, in some journal comment, and I said my position is. It's absolutely obscene to engage in such even type of design. Namely, what is greatest sin? Holocaust or colonialism? And I found this, uh, uh, because if you measure it in a certain way, of course it's Holocaust. It's unique, industrialized murder. On the other hand, I mean this term ironically now, don't underestimate colonialism, the horrors it did. For example, and here I'm very open, even to some, something that some people will proclaim that I am betraying the left here. Visit Accra in Ghana, visit slavery museum somewhere, and you learn that there were no bad white people up the river catching slaves. These entities, I don't know if in our European sense they were states or not, I don't mean this in a, uh, a patronizing way, but the political entities, slavery was widely developed there already. And the white person stayed there mostly on one or another island and just were dealing, uh, just were dealing with it. So that's uh, one point. Second point, show me one civilization in the entire, I don't know, you will really hear me for a right wing. Uh, show me one civilization after Neolithic which didn't have slaves. I know not even one. Especially, uh, for example, uh, 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 you know when did Saudi Arabia formally, they still have slaves, abolished slavery in 1962, no? And so on. And if you compare, it can be done, the number of slaves taken by Western European whites to the United States and the number of slaves taken in East Africa by the Arabs, the number is the same, around 10 million. So uh, uh, now I will say something really provocative by what you will say. So what did the white people, what is the new thing that the white people did? They started a movement against slavery. The only one. It was insincere, they cheated in all possible ways and so on. But it was, uh, it was done. Now, I'm not in this sense simplifying uh, slavery and black humiliation. Let's be serious. I know, I, I'm even in theory sympathetic to so called Afro pessimism, you know, how this radical disobjectivization of blacks persists. I, I buy all that. Uh, but just, okay, to make you aware in what shit hole of a country you live here. I read recently a book about the opium war. You know what horror war this, was this? In Bengal, in India, English colonizers let people starving and may, uh, didn't grow enough food for them, were growing mostly opium, exploiting, uh, sorry, uh, 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 
uh, uh, uh, sending it to China. Then a young Chinese emperor was desperate. Millions of people at the end wrote a nice letter to Queen Victoria, already even didn't, uh, even didn't get a reply, and then all he did was just to prohibit import of opium, more or less. And the country was attacked by all Western powers, and you know what this meant for China? Not per capita, but as a global economic power. In 1820, China was still three times stronger than United Kingdom. The, or how was it called at that time? The British Empire, I don't know. Whatever. So in 20 years, you cannot imagine the catastrophe. Two thirds of the entire economy went bankrupt. So, I mean, you know, don't, so my idea is simply, it's something obscene to play the game which is worse. Okay. You know, it's like to debate, I know, consciously provocative. Mm -hmm. What would hurt you more, if I squeeze your testicle or if you put needles into your eyes? <laughs> so, this is tasteless. We should say both is beyond certain. So, Back to your question. Okay. No, 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 no,
nation state and so on. So now I'm asking you, not as a provocation, but I, I desperately am looking for some good news. <laughs> Just don't tell me local, local self-management cooperation and so on and so on. I think that we live in a global era and I don't believe in this people will send organize them here, there. You know? Oh, 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 oh. Sorry. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna buffer because that's the only hope we have. So we're gonna go there. Uh, ah, I know go. what's wrong with you. What? There too much left. <laughs> <laughs> Make your judgments as you will. No, we've got one there. No, but the guy there, yeah. Yeah, the check shirt you want, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're going to check. Because he was yeah. ready before. No, I'll tell you what was going on. All right, let's go here. Okay. Hi, Professor. Good evening. Thank you for, uh, for an interesting uh, presentation. Although I In my language, interesting means you disagree, but what do people like that? <laughs> uh, what I was going to say is that it was interesting, but I wish it had more of a point and a conclusion and a clear thread. Um, you know, my language is, is pretty clear and honest. But, you know, you are a person of a certain age. The end will probably, you will still probably enjoy the world as it is, and if I'm lucky, I will be marginally younger than you. But look at the audience, there are people in their 20s or even younger, and I think, you know, that this sort of pessimism slash sort of cynicism you're exhibiting, I respect that, but there's not much they can take away from it, because you're basically saying you're fucked. And, I mean, do you have any practical advice for young people in this audience, other than you will witness the end of the world as you know it, because it's fine when you say it in this nice little okay. auditorium. Good question. So, Thank you. Um, it's, by the way, I'm enjoying the fact that you're raising the young, the youngest people sitting directly opposite you immediately followed by a swear word. Guys, don't use this language. Right? There's a tradition at the Royal Institution that the youngest people in the room can ask anything they want at any time, so you just give me a nod and we'll bring the mic. But we've got check up next. We're going to take a couple and then you'll come back. Yep. Uh, it's working. Um, you introduced uh, the Bhagavad Gita when you were discussing, yeah. like, almost right after you talked about like this radical freedom, like the ontological incompleteness of the universe. Yeah. You introduced the Bhagavad Gita as like almost like a foil to that. But I feel like in that text, there is this sort of idea of like if you're disconnected from the consequences of your action, it is that at that point I feel like radical freedom would open up that alternative future or alternative to sort of symbolic norm would occur. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you think that's true or there's something there and that like juxtaposing that with the sort of, you know, evil interpretation of Himmler. Okay, we'll take one more as, uh, as the buffer in the two. Yeah, we've got a hand went straight up there look, in the dark shirt. I can see, yes. Oh, yeah, I don't know how to get that. Thank you. Uh, I know you're a fan of Hegel, and in the spirit of hope for everyone, you started with T.S. Eliot, and then you said something about necessity and not really con uh, contingency in the world. And then you mentioned Gaza, and I'm wondering, a lot of what you started with has to do with Spinoza. It's, a, it's at the core of it, and maybe it's perhaps what, I don't know, the conflicts in the world right now would need. And so, since it's, I don't know, very connected to everything that you said, I think would bring together the points raised and a bit of the hope for the world. What's your opinion on Spinoza and all of these, like tying together all your points today? Okay, that's right. one. So, we've got advice for the young, we've got the Bhagavad Gita and the acceptance, and we've got Spinoza. What, what are you going to do? Uh, first, you okay, can begin at the end, Spinoza. This is, of course, a question for another lecture. For sure. And you also probably, for me and the rest, just give us a word of what you think, why, why Spinoza is being brought up at this point. What, is, what, do, what do people mean by Spinoza in this context? Yeah. But for me, even in, in mo most uh, contemporary readings, Deleuze and so on, there is no place in Spinoza for what I... Uh, we call modern, I'm absolutely a partisan of modern subjectivity. Descartes, Kant, these are the greatest revolution. And uh, uh, I simply, it looks, I can put it like this, going back to the beginning. How, maybe I'm misreading Spinoza, but where do you find this 
ontological openness in Spinoza. Is Spinoza precisely... Quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics. Sorry? Quantum mechanics, yeah. he's shouting. That makes sense out of Spinoza. Because that's more methodological than quantum mechanics. Yeah, but that's not moment that is like present is made in that moment. Okay. So, so it's the collapse of the wave function. Yes, which is yes, saying, yes. Right? And he anticipates in that state of the language. So, so the claim is that Spinoza anticipated the notion of the collapse of the wave function yeah. that, that, and that the modern physics which talks about yeah. uh, uncertainty until you observe it and then it becomes certain which you describe as being historical is prefigured by Spinoza. Well, okay, but, uh, so, okay, I mean, again, we will too much into it here, but uh, for me, again, ontologically, it shows the world is, uh, I, I believe that in the most radical reading of quantum physics, there are multiple realities all against some radical abyss threatening on the edge of self-destruction, here are a strict Hegelian. I don't see where you find this in Spinoza. We would... Okay, well, well, no, 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 get that. So, um, <laughs> uh, you want to do advice for the young? You want to do Bhagavad Gita? No, let's uh, then do Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita... Uh, 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 nonetheless, you know the most famous scene where... Uh, Arjuna doubts should I lead the army into attack and then Krishna who appears to him and gives him the lesson, no. Uh, I simply reject this as a proper ethical act. I think that proper, here I'm a Kantian, again provoking you. You know, Kant says something much more subversive in this, in his Practical, critique of practical reason. It's not just do your duty unconditionally, or as they say in German, do kannst then do souls. You can because you must. But it's also you are totally responsible for your duty. You are never in this objective. Let's say we are friends, then I have to do something horrible to you. And then I can tell you, sorry, we're still friends, but you know that's my duty. No, I'm not allowed. I must, to do this, I must totally stand subjectively behind what I see as my duty. Duty cannot be objectivized. That's for me modern freedom. So if you go to, you know, now we are going to, and we'll be very brief to different experience, uh, namely, uh, and I have many friends in India, and maybe they are one-sided, but, uh, but they tend to agree with me they, that it's not objective, that uh, the greatest catastrophe of India was around year zero, a little bit earlier, the defeat of Buddhism. And then this violent return of, violent return of, uh, of Hinduism. You know, uh, because, uh, uh, Buddhism, although I also have problems there, is for me uh, this sense of uh, this sense of how should I put it of some abyss of freedom, nothing is substantially true, and so on and so on, which does not mean any kind of relativism and so on and so on. Uh, 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 Bhagavad Gita is just uh, I claim, okay, I stop so that I don't get lost. You know, this identity of my ego and the world soul, or whatever. My problem is precisely they are not identical. I am a failure in the universe. I, I, and that's for me, that's why I call myself, with a little bit of irony, uh, atheist Christian. I think this is for me, the materialist, even lesson of Christianity. As Hegel put it, what dies on the cross, it's not a representative of God. It's God of beyond himself. After that, we get Holy Spirit. What is Holy Spirit? The community of believers. Who are, of believers who are radically, who are radically free. So my idea is this radical notion of freedom where we are left to our own. We cannot rely neither on 
Marxist notion of progress or whatever, you are on your own, radically. Okay. Uh, and then the young people. We'll, come, we'll hold the young people over and I will hold you to it, but let me tell you what's going to happen. Some of you I can see uh, need to go. We're going to be done by 2035, so we've got, we're going to finish five minutes late, according to the programme. I'm going to take three more interventions. We're going to roll them in. We're going to come back to the There's one there. Uh, there's one... Uh, yeah, let's go with that one and let's go with the front here, and then we'll see what we're going to go after that. Yeah. So yeah, give it next seven, please. Yeah, you know you. Yeah. Go. Yes. Yeah. The guy. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm very sorry that, that uh, you today you are much constrained uh, or much restrained uh, in in terms of the way you speak, uh, as if you were uh, afraid of something. Uh, and this leads to my question on freedom of speech. It is very sad to see that. Uh, Comparing to what you have spoken uh, in in South Bank in 2015 uh, about uh, the uh, conflict in 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 between Israeli and Pakistani, and to what you uh, comment on this uh, conflict in uh, the uh, Frankfurt uh, Book Fair and today, uh, it seems to me that you are way more constrained. Uh, is there, who is Shabu Shishik uh, actually afraid of? Okay, that's a great question. We'll take that. No, no, excuse me. Um, we will, uh, yeah, please. I hear you. By the way, true fans, right? They're comparing what you said this time with the two previous ones. I think we're going here next, and then we've got time for one more. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I got a question. Like, how can you be sure that the political initiatives you're making at the moment are absolutely right? I don't think we can structure the future by analyzing the past. From a center point of view, the future can be indeed be understood as the sum of countless moments. But for the present, the present is in a complex system, it's an entanglement of countless plots. I think there is no one determined direction. There's no one determined direction. Okay, so how can you be sure you're doing the right thing? I think is the question. Do you have one more for me? Uh, okay, let's go to the back. Say again. They don't even look this way. <laughs> no. I didn't even look this way. I think that's unfair. Okay. There is no way we're going to get it. What's true? They don't look this way. Now you're looking. <laughs> Congratulations. Go ahead. So what do you think about uh, AI, artificial intelligence? Uh, start to replace jobs? Is this maybe the answer for communism, maybe? Very good. So we're going to come back to the advice for the young. We've got what are you scared of and how do you know you're right and AI. And four minutes. <laughs> okay, let's uh, uh, how do I know that I am right? You know precisely what is in my universe totally prohibited is this idea present is incredibly complex, we cannot be right and so on and so on. No, ethically in different situations we, without pretending any to any radical absolute knowing, we know we can be right at a philosophical reflexive level. What do we mean by this? Let's return to anti-Semitism. My old example, let's say I am in Germany 35, sitting with an anti-Semite, and we debate are the Jews really the way they are, that they are uh, profiting, uh, seducing our women, and so on and so on. The moment, we should also debate this, but this is not the right debate. Here, you can always come, oh, you say Jews are good, but there is some Jew there who stole that money from me. You find examples for everything. I believe in the power of abstraction, vertical abstraction here, not some globalization, but the true question, and there we can give an absolute answer. The true question is not, is the Nazi idea of a Jew correct or not, but why did the Nazis, to sustain their self-identity, need something like the figure of a Jew? Because if you take the figure of a Jew away, Nazism collapses. 
why it is a very simplified analysis because the group is needed to sustain their corporate vision which is our society is basically one uh, uh, homogeneous orgasm then an intruder comes the Jews and uh, ruins it and so on and so on so uh, I don't have time to go into it in detail but you see my point my point is that uh, of course there is infinite complexity and so on and so on but where did you I would doubt your certainty when I this very view of reality as infinitely complex, interacting, and so on and so on, is for me already a very dogmatic presupposition. I, I don't, uh, but that's, we don't have that. Yes, there's a claim that you're frightened of something, and I, I mean, ah, you know, I, 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 not, it's not hypocritical. I like that question very much because it enables you to make my point. Don't be afraid. Do you think that I'm such an idiot that I didn't know what will happen in Frankfurt after my speech, which was extremely constrained? You know, like all the figures I was quoting were who? Under quotation marks, I'm sorry, who to use? Even Moshe Dayan is quoted. By, admit, by admitting, yeah, yeah, that one, by admitting precisely that Gazans had the right to attack the kibbutz there in 56. You know what was my test? And it worked. I asked myself, if I just say Palestine free from the, uh, from the river to the sea, blah, blah, although this is, should be specified, I doubt it, of course, everybody it will be just, you know, ah, you've chosen your side. What I tried to do is to be as considerate as possible and see, will this be acceptable? And that was a shock for me. Not only with all this constraint approach there, not only it didn't save me in any way the front page in Bild and those horrible German daily newspaper attacks on me were even worse because they claimed instead of openly uh, 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 admitting that I'm supporting a terrorist, I'm hiding, I'm hypocritical and so on and so on. That's what I really wanted to test and it's a very, if you want, antagonistic Marxist lesson. It is that even if you try to be very considerate, you know, I gave all the all the way through. I mean, I admit that these, that yes, Hamas and so on. For example, no, 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 no. Let's go on. Three or four. AI and then yeah, we're gonna we're gonna finish. And then the AI and then afterwards, just do do young people. And we got the Christmas lecture. No, I would I would prefer. I prefer what Christmas lectures. Oliver Cromwell did one good thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that. You know, you're, 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 I'm going to hold AI over for the lectures. I'm really sorry, but we have to keep it tight. I'm going to press you on the young people. Just say a couple of sentences, please, Slavik, on, on what would you say to the young? It's a fair question. But nonetheless, I you know what is no, my no. problem? My problem is not this all-powerful powerfulness of the AI, but that in its very omnipotence, it's stupid. It cannot use its own mistakes and so on. Spirit for me begins when something goes wrong and you profit from it. Good. But not time now. The sentence for the young, and then we'll go to the, to the outside. Uh, 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 I would, uh, uh, what shocks me a little bit is, okay, I am not young, but I have two sons, one is much younger than you. And so, uh, why I find it strange, what is the, now I will do a not philosophical, but hermeneutic analysis. When you say the young people, what do you mean? I see a fundamental ambiguity in it. Do you mean 
I may be right, but it's not good to tell this to the young people because you ruin their future. Or are you saying, since you are an old creepy guy, I mean disrespectfully towards <laughs> me, uh, it's not only bad for uh, no perspective to the young people, but you are factually wrong. And I would, because that's the same argument that goes, for example, with freedom of the will. The argument of Habermas is not, there is no freedom of the will, but if we renounce the freedom of the will, the very morality, responsibility of our mind is lost. So, uh, 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 like, again, this is what I don't get. I think it is like this. At what level you don't agree? Do you <laughs> think, no, no, you see what I wanted to say. Do you think that we don't have, we shouldn't say the truth too directly because the young people will be desperate? Or do you think, uh, uh, or do you think uh, uh, that there is hope? and young people will maybe see it, and so on and so on. So I'm going to stop you with that question. And I think it feels to me appropriate and reasonable that we stop in with a question to the audience. My friends, I'm sorry for the overrun. It's really hard to interrupt this guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a Friday evening discourse on, a uh, Wednesday evening discourse, in fact, on AI, which I commend to you, and the Christmas lectures I also do. We're going to look at AI and see if we can come up. No, no, you're back. So, <laughs> so, what is that? You don't know what is dialogue. Yeah. I, I don't. Yeah. I like the dialogue. Yeah. I like late Plato's dialogues, where one guy talks all the time, yeah. and the other you just says every 10 minutes by Zeus, so it is so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? No, no, I uh, the guy who every 10 minutes is talking. So I shall be continuing to talk outside. Uh, if there is a book signing. Please do feel free to buy a copy. Um, we're going to have to move that signing thing forward as we have here. But please, before you leave, and thank you for staying late, join me in thanking our speaker.